Good morning. Welcome to this service of the Word at St Nicholas Bathampton. We come together in the name of Christ online to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Another version of the Bible puts it this way, that they may have life and have it abundantly. The they means us. Jesus came so that we may enjoy abundant life as we trust in him. We're going to think more about the abundance of God's love and provision for us a little later. But let's first sing a, a hymn. Bless the Lord, O my soul, worship his holy name. Let's praise God together. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sin like never before, O oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship
That last hymn has a line in it, as you'll have seen, about 10,000 reasons for my heart to find to be able to sing about the goodness of God and his abundant provision for us. And if you're still here at the end of the service, you'll see that the last hymn that we're going to sing also contains 10,000, 10,000 blessings, all mine from God. Why 10,000? Is there something significant to that uh, number? Well, I just think it's like, think of a very large number, the largest number you can think of. It really just means lots and lots and lots. If we were to put that into modern English, we might say it means shed loads. That's how much God has uh, his love for us and his abundant provision for us. And in the Old Testament, instead of sheds, you might have spoken about cartloads. And there's a psalm, Psalm 65, we won't read it all, but it speaks of God's abundant provision for his people in providing rain for the land, which brings on the harvest. And then there's uh, corn that overflows, there's so much of it that the carts overflow with abundance. And that's something to sing about too. Now, I've got to sing, to sing to uh, about how much God loves us and the abundance of his love for us. So, so much that you can't weigh it all, you can't measure it all. You can weigh an elephant's auntie, you can weigh a pedigree flea, but you can't weigh up all the love that Jesus has for me. Now, I looked for a recording of this song, but I couldn't find one, so I'm going to just have to play it myself. Let's see how it goes. You can weigh an elephant's auntie, you can weigh a pedigree flea, but you can't weigh up all the love that Jesus has for me, 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 that Jesus has for me. Okay, shall we try that once again? You can see if you can join in too. You can weigh an elephant's auntie, you can weigh a pedigree flea, but you can't weigh up all the love that Jesus has for me, 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 that Jesus has for me. You can measure the length of a wiggly worm or the height of an alley goat's knee, but you can't measure all the love that Jesus has for me, 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 that Jesus has for me. God loves us abundantly, shed loads. But if we're honest, every one of us knows that we don't Always love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul and mind and strength and we need to say sorry and ask him to forgive us. Let's pray to God together using the words of this prayer of confession. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May God, who loved the world so much, that he sent his Son to be our Saviour, forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our junior church already happened on Zoom at 10 o'clock. Many thanks to Emily for leading that. If anyone watching this now would like to join in with, with junior church next week, please send an email to the church office at the address shown here, which you can also find on the church web pages, and we'll send you the link. OK, children, you don't have to stay for the rest of this service, but make sure you're doing what your grown-ups say you can do. For everyone who is staying with us here, Hannah Findlay is going to read to us from the Bible. Isaiah 55, verses 1 to 5. Come, all you who are thirsty... Come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. 
Why spend money on what is not bread and your labour on what does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may survive. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations and you know not, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you, because the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed with you splendour. This is Matthew 15, verse 29 to 16, verse 12. Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great clouds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the cripple made well, the lame walking and the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish, and when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was 4,000 besides women and children. After Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into the boat and went to the vicinity of Magadan. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to see Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, it is because we didn't bring any bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, you of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in the bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Thank you, Hannah. Before Margaret White speaks to us about abundance in God's kingdom, let's sing of our great Redeemer who feeds us with the bread of heaven.
Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Speak, O Lord, and fulfil in us your purposes for your glory. Amen. Over to you, Margaret. Good morning, church family. I was fortunate enough to grow up in a Christian home, and as a child, one of my favourite songs had these words. Tell me the stories of Jesus I love to hear, things I would ask him to tell me if he were here, scenes by the wayside, tales of the sea, stories of Jesus, tell them to me. It's very special to have these few moments this morning to think about one of the stories of Jesus, a real event that occurred at a real place and time in the life of our Lord. And so as we begin, let's pray together. Father God, please help us to listen to you, to learn from you, and to love you more. In Jesus' name, Amen. The word kingdom is found 155 times in the New Testament, and 54 of those times are in the Gospel of Matthew, just over a third. Matthew's way of presenting the gospel is as the good news of God's kingdom. When Jesus started his public ministry, Matthew records that he began with these words, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. In the fullness of time, heaven's king will fully rule over the earth once again. And at the end of his gospel, Matthew records Jesus as saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so through his gospel, Matthew gradually builds up for us a picture of Jesus the King and life in his kingdom. I have a friend who's an artist. She paints beautiful pictures of wildlife. And during the last few weeks of lockdown, I've been privileged to see via WhatsApp some of her pictures taking shape. First a layer of colour appears, then another then a little detail, and so on, until eventually the whole picture emerges. We can think of the story that we're looking at today, the feeding of the 4,000, as building up another layer in Matthew's gospel picture of Jesus as King. It's my hope and prayer that over the next few minutes, we'll have another layer added to our understanding and appreciation of Jesus as our King, that we'll get to know him better, that we'll learn more of what it means to live in his kingdom, and that we'll be encouraged and filled with joy as a result. So what does this story show us about the kingdom of heaven and the kingship of Jesus? As I read this passage, the immediate thing that strikes me is the abundance of everything. Lots of people, lots of disease, lots of need, lots of food. So we're going to focus on the idea of abundance in the kingdom. And first of all, we see that Jesus has 
abundant power. Verse 30 tells us, Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet. In a mastery of understatement, it simply says, and he healed them. Can you imagine the power needed to heal people who'd never been able to walk, who had missing limbs, who'd never seen or never spoken? These were not recoveries or cures, such as medicine might enable. They were not people beginning to feel better from a cold or shaking off some backache. It wasn't a, a case of being encouraged to feel stronger or exercise mind over matter. These healings were miracle after miracle. The forming and forging of new limbs, the reforming of eyes that had never worked so that they could see. This is extraordinary power. Only God has power to create, to transform physicality in this way. Only he can bring something from nothing, can effect this kind of transformation. This is the sixth time in his gospel that Matthew speaks of King Jesus healing the crowds. It wasn't a one-off. It was part of a pattern showing that Jesus was God's son, the king, and what his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, looks like. When God rules completely, when all things are in accordance with his will, when all rebellion against him is quashed, there is wholeness and perfection, the eradication of all that is damaging and harmful, the mending of all that is broken. When his ultimate reign and complete rule is established, Revelation tells us that there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things will have passed away. These miraculous healings were a foretaste of that day when the kingdom is complete. We know from Mark's gospel that this event took place in the region of the Decapolis, the ten cities which were to the east of the river Jordan and which were largely populated by Gentiles, non-Jews. These people of different ethnicities could see that Jesus' power was from God. They praised the God of Israel. So as Matthew builds up his picture of King Jesus, he's adding another layer, showing us his abundant power. Jesus' power is the mighty, creative power of God, abundant in magnitude. And it's also abundant in reach. It's for all people. The power of God is not confined just to the Jewish people through whom the saviour of the world would come, but is for everyone, of every tribe and tongue and nation. King Jesus is for anyone of any background, ethnicity, race or nationality. His kingdom is open for the poor, the diseased, the inadequate, the needy, the unlovable and the undeserving. There are no conditions. The abundant power of God in King Jesus is for everyone. It is for anyone. And secondly, we see that King Jesus has abundant compassion. I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. Matthew records Jesus as saying, Jesus has already shown great compassion in healing so many people over three days. But now he looks beyond their obvious serious need of deafness or lameness to their immediate needs of hunger. They were not in danger of starvation. They weren't in danger of dying. That wasn't the point. The point was that Jesus was really concerned that they might collapse or faint from hunger on their way home. It would be unpleasant for them. It would be inconvenient, a worry, and he was keen to help. Here's another layer to our picture of King Jesus. Not only does he have immense power, but he also has immense compassion. He cares about the small things in our lives as well as the big things. He notices the little things. He knows that they matter to us. I wonder if we ever really grasp these two truths, God's power and his compassion. Psalm 62 puts it like this. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard, power 
belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love. I wonder which of these we find it harder to accept and trust in. God's power or God's love? Do you consider that your problems are too hard for God to deal with? Or too small for him to care about? The truth is that nothing is too hard for God and nothing is too small for God. Do you truly live conscious that Jesus is king, which means that he is sovereign and rules with power, and that he is full of love, which means he has compassion on all that he has made, yourself included. God looks at your life and my life right now with power and compassion. Nothing is too big for him to resolve. Nothing is too small for him to care about. No wonder that Paul, who had such a strong grasp of the gospel, prayed that the Ephesians might have power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, then immediately offering praise to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. King Jesus' abundant power and abundant compassion resulted, thirdly, in abundant provision. Jesus' comment about the needs of the people is made to his disciples, who respond by asking, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? It seems unlikely that they will have forgotten the miraculous feeding of the 5,000 described in the previous chapter, but perhaps they thought it was a one-off, not to be repeated. Maybe they didn't want to be presumptive. Whatever the explanation, it is clear that they knew themselves to be inadequate to the task. This too is part of kingdom life. We have to acknowledge our own inadequacy the needs we see around us are huge. The problems in the world are enormous. We have very little to offer in the face of this ourselves. Why does Jesus bother to use the seven loaves? He doesn't need them. He could have fed the crowd from nothing. After all, he healed them from nothing. So why couldn't he feed them from nothing? The seven loaves being given back to Jesus Act as a reminder that as we live under his kingship, we are always and only acting as stewards of what is his. Everything we have is from God. In his kingdom, he graciously encourages us to remember that and to give it back to him for use in his service. There's no blessing for us or for others in holding tightly on to what we have. God invites us to work with him in this world as his friends and agents, and he's willing to use and bless what we offer back to him. In doing this, in giving back for God's use the little that we have, we also can begin to develop the sort of compassion that Jesus showed and which should be characteristic of his followers. Giving back to him what we have for his service and the blessing of others helps us to grow in our discipleship, helps us to grow as his stewards, helps us to grow as his friends. And so the Bible repeatedly urges us to give what little we do have back to God and see him bless it. Realising how little we have is a good place to start. If we give back to God our little love, our little compassion, our little resource in terms of money, or time, or energy, our tiny grain of willingness, our small desire to serve him, our meagre resource, then God blesses it. What's the tiny thing that you can offer to God today that he can bless and miraculously transform? He hands it back to us to share with others and in doing so works a miracle. God provides abundantly, not only for us, but in a multiplicity of blessing for others. In God's kingdom, the tiny offering turned into abundant.
provision. There are seven large basketfuls left over. Imagine great big hampers, abundant provision and plenty to spare. This is how the economy of the kingdom of heaven works. I wonder if you find it puzzling that the next thing we read is the Pharisees and Sadducees testing Jesus by asking him for a sign. They seem to be trying to trick him or catch him out, or perhaps they were after unshakable proof of who he was. Jesus repeated to them what they'd already been told in chapter 12, that the only sign they would get would be that of Jonah, predicting his rising from death after three days. Why were the disciples, and why are we, so strongly warned against what they were doing? The abundant power of King Jesus, his abundant compassion and his abundant provision are all evident for us to see in the way he lived his life on earth. The picture builds up through Matthew's Gospel layer by layer and they are also evident in his death on the cross and his rising three days later. These events clearly demonstrate his power over sin and all that is evil and harmful the depths of his compassion for our every need and his abundant provision of forgiveness and wholeness and new life. They clearly demonstrate who he was, God's son and earth's rightful king. There is already abundant evidence demonstrating the kingship of Jesus. We should look for nothing more because there is nothing more to find. Jesus came that we might have life in its fullness, abundant life. He is the king of the whole world. He has the power to meet our every need. His compassion seeks to provide for all that we need. If we seek something further, we will miss the very kingdom that is on offer. Seek first his kingdom, said Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Amen. Thank you. As we reflect on what Margaret has said, let's listen to this next hymn. It was new to me when we heard it a couple of weeks ago, and its words provide much food for thought. As we ponder how we can give ourselves to the service of God, let us hear these words of grace, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Oh! 
Now before Angela Donald leads us in prayer, together let's affirm our faith in Jesus, the Word made flesh, God with us, full of grace and truth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of us all. The Word became flesh and lived for a while among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your constant watchfulness over us in our lives and your loving presence that guides us each day. Thank you for asking us to follow you, allowing us to trust you and wanting us to love you. And as we pray, we know that you are walking beside us on our journey. In our prayers, we become conscious of our failings, our wrong turnings and choices. We so often put ourselves first in selfish actions and don't love each other as we should. We ask your forgiveness for all that we have done wrong during this week and we ask for your guidance to put things right. Great crowds came to him and he healed them. Jesus cured so many people and we know, Lord, that you are the great healer of our minds and bodies. You take into your care those who are unwell and suffering. And we pray for your strength and comfort for the vulnerable people in our village and in our families and friends. We also ask for wisdom and knowledge for doctors and scientists in these fragile times, especially those who are working on a vaccine for the virus, that they make progress towards an essential cure. We think of anyone going through hardship at the moment, losing their jobs and unable to find work. And we hope the economy will be gradually restored and pray that charities like Food Bank can help all the people who need them. Come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come by and eat. Heavenly Father, you are there for everyone without cost. But there are many people in other parts of the world who do not know of your love and struggle through each day with deprived and difficult lives. 
We ask your help for them, and we thank you for the many that put themselves at risk to change the lives of others in dangerous places. We think particularly of David and Heather Sharland and pray for their safety. Faith is a commitment and a vital part of our love for you. Sometimes we lean on it, sometimes we discard it at our peril, but we always need it. Your faithfulness to us, Lord, never falters, guiding and protecting us throughout our life, giving us the strength we need. Your faithful love given to David, your faithful love offered to us all. Amen. Let's say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and for ever. Amen. Well, some news and notices. There's not a lot to say. John T. and the Frith family are on uh, away on, uh, this week. We um, hope they have a, a good time of rest. Uh, if there's uh, any concerns that uh, you need to contact anyone about, then um, don't hesitate to get in touch with either myself or Anna as church wardens. Um, after the service, there will be a Zoom coffee time on the usual number, which is up there. And you can find um, also... Um, on the web page um, and th also uh, don't forget uh, if you wish to uh, phone up uh, Phil and Molly for some prayer concern um, use the prayer line number that you have up there and of course uh, if you know of anyone who can't um, watch in on this um, live stream but would like to listen to the service uh, later during the week then there's the dialer service number which you can pass on to them for their use um, the details that were before the service uh, are for our regular givers, either by standing order or by using the text giving to St Nicholas uh, 70470 and either of those um, uh, texts, messages there. Uh, and then our giving um, project, our mission project uh, for the moment is the Bread of Life Society, which again appeared on the loop beforehand. And... You can also give by text there or indeed by a standing order and letting Rita know uh, what, um, that, you, that you've uh, given that amount for mission. So, God is faithful. His great love, his abundant compassion is new every morning. Let's sing. Great is thy faithfulness.
may your blessing be upon us in this day. Confirm in us the truth by which we rightly live. Confront us with the truth from which we wrongly turn. We ask not for what we want, but for what you know we need, as we offer this day and ourselves for you and to you, through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen.